here for our second service. We have a 10 o'clock and then this uh, 11.30. Now you can hear me. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so, all right. So we had to move our services up in Gerald. So I just came from Gerald and was there for their two services and then drove over here for the second one. So thanks so much, Brian, Pastor Brian, for uh, covering the first service. Um, and it's great to be here and, and worship the Lord. Uh, we're starting a brand new series, Hope for the Holidays. How many of you could use a little bit of hope? Any of you could use a little bit of, of hope during the holidays? Holidays are a difficult time, aren't they? I mean, the, the, the days are shorter, so it seems like it's dark more, and it just feels dark to a lot of people. We have what's called a raise in, in depression. It's called sad, seasonal, affective disorder. So there's, there's more uh, depression uh, during the holidays, a lot more suicides and things like that. So we just need to be aware and be praying uh, for people during this time. And as I've said before, 2020 is one of the toughest years, and, and people are more anxious than ever. There's a lot of anxiety uh, in our world, right? A lot of uncertainty. Uh, there was a politician recently that said we'd be entering into a dark winter. Well, that sounds encouraging, doesn't it? A dark winter with coronavirus on the rise and maybe more shutdowns. And so there just seems to be a lot of uncertainty when it comes to economy, election, pandemic. It's like, whew, wow, it's a lot. But we find hope in the Lord, don't we? We find hope in Jesus Christ. We find hope in his word. We find purpose in being the people of God. And that's what we're going to look at today. That no matter what is going on, we can find hope in the Lord. So I just want to take an opportunity to pray for us. Would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Lord, thank you for this time together where we can worship you. Thank you for the songs that we can sing to you. Thank you for the, the, the fellowship that we can have with brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, thank you for your word that we can look at. And I pray that you would speak to us today, Lord, through <clears throat> your word. Lord, give us an encouragement. Lord, give us hope. We look to you, our rock, our stronghold, our fortress. In difficult times, may we find even greater hope in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to, to see each of you guys here, uh, old-time friends here. Kara Sanders, it's great to, to see you. Okay, okay, Kenny's coming. All right. Well, good. We'll look forward to seeing him today, too. If you have your Bible, you can turn with us to Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> We're going to be looking at the Gospel of Luke, the Christmas story, which is found in chapters 1 and 2. And I, uh, so the, the verses will be on the screen behind you here, and then they're also in your program when you came in, or if you brought a Bible, you can just turn over to Luke chapter 1. I want to just read, uh, we're going to start with verse 5, that's what your outline will start with, and it'll be on behind you, but I just want to read Luke's uh, gospel introduction. Uh, Luke is a Gentile, writing to Gentile uh, audience, and Luke was not a, a follower, a disciple of Jesus, he, didn't, he wasn't an eyewitness of Jesus himself, but he talked to eyewitnesses. And so he gets his uh, account from people like Mary and, uh, and others. And so we're going to see some very intimate looks at Mary and Elizabeth. And, and Luke covers such beautiful detail of people's lives, their stories, their feelings uh, within Luke's gospel. Hey, Kenny, we get... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we get some of the parables that you don't find anywhere else, like the Good Samaritan and uh, like the Prodigal Son that's found in, in Luke's gospel. But Luke says this, he says, Insomuch as many have taken to hand down uh, a narrative of the things which have been fulfilled among us uh, from the beginning, and the eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me, having had a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of the things which you were instructed. So Luke tells us that he wants to write an orderly account of, of the gospel and all the things that has taken place. And he says, I'm writing this. He mentioned a guy by the name of Theophilus, and the word Theophilus means friend of God. And some people believe that Theophilus could just stand for 
all believers, all friends of God, but most people believe that Theophilus was actually, it says most honorable Theophilus, he was probably a wealthy man. And some people think that Luke was actually a slave. He was a doctor, Dr. Luke, but he was also a slave that was uh, given freedom by Theophilus to write this account. So Luke writes this gospel account, and, and just FYI, if you like, Bible trivia, Luke writes more of the New Testament than anyone else. 27% of the New Testament was written by Dr. Luke. That's kind of crazy, right? Because Paul, with all his letters, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, uh, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, all that only makes up 24% of the New Testament. But Luke's gospel and the book of Acts accounts for 27% of the New Testament. So Luke is a very, very good writer. He's writes in very high Greek. He's very eloquent. He's, he's very detailed. Uh, Sir Walter Ramsey calls him one of the greatest historians of our era because he mentions uh, names, dates, with, with incredible detail and incredible accuracy. So um, that's just an introduction to the book of Luke. Now, beginning with verse 5, and so our message today is hope in the darkness, and God is working, be faithful. Do you believe that, that God is working? Right? God is, is at work in our lives, even though it seems chaotic, even though it seems like things don't make sense around us, and, and, and the times that we're living in reminds me of the times that, that, that this story takes place. Luke's gospel was written during a time of great uncertainty, a great darkness, great chaos that was taking place around, and, and God stepped into that chaos. God steps into that silence. God steps into that darkness with some wonderful, wonderful news. And so beginning with verse 5, there was in the days of Herod. Now, how many of y'all have heard of King Herod? King Herod, crazy King Herod. We read about him in Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men didn't report back with the news that he wanted. He got all mad and he sent soldiers to Bethlehem to wipe out, kill all the babies two years old and younger, the male babies. So he was that type of power-hungry, bloodthirsty type of individuals. It would be like saying, in the days of Hitler, you, your mind would immediately go, oh, yeah. So Hitler, uh, Hitler. <laughs> Herod was that type of individual. He was very brutal. Uh, he, he, in fact, he was appointed by Caesar Augustus. And Caesar Augustus said it would be better to be a pig than to be one of Herod's sons. Because Herod killed off several of his sons because he was thinking that they might take over. He killed off several of his wives. He was very paranoid. He was very brutal. But he was also an incredible builder. If you've ever been to Israel, uh, Herod's buildings are still standing. If you go to Caesarea, he built this great aqueduct. He built the city of Caesarea, a great aqueduct. If you've ever heard of Masada, this huge fortress on the top of a hill overlooking the Dead Sea, Herod built Masada. Herod built this huge palace called the Herodian. Uh, Herod redid the temple. And so when Jesus is walking around teaching at the temple and temple courts, that's the temple that Herod built, more grand than even Solomon's first temple. So Herod was an incredible builder, but he was a difficult leader. So he was appointed by Caesar Augustus in about 30 uh, <clears throat> BC. So this is a little bit about Herod. And, and what we need to see here is between the Old Testament and the New Testament, a lot of things have taken place. You had 400 years of silence between Old Testament and New Testament, and yet God was so at work within that 400 years. So I just want to read to you the last part of the Old Testament. This is in Malachi chapter 4, and this is what Malachi chapter 4 says because it's setting the stage for what we're just about to read. So Malachi chapter 4 says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers and the children, uh, and, and lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So the warning here is, is that I, I'm going to send someone like Elijah. I'm going to send Elijah, and he's going to turn the hearts of the, the children and the fathers back to me unless I strike the earth with a curse. So it's setting up this sort of like, hmm, this <laughs> interesting conundrum here. And so now we get into 
the New Testament, and you have 400 years that have taken place. What took place during that 400 years? Let me quickly give you a rundown of the history. So <clears throat> when, the, when the Old Testament closes, you have the Persians are the world power at this time. And then after the Persians, a guy by the name of Alexander the Great conquers the known world in 333 BC. And what that did was that, that gave all of the known world the same language. And so they had what's called Koine Greek, which is what the New Testament is written in. So God was preparing the whole world to have a common language so that the gospel could readily spread. So Alexander the Great was able to do that. When he died, then his four generals were, were put in place of his empire and so you had Cassius, Antiochus, uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy. And so the area of Israel was ruled by the general named Ptolemy. And Ptolemy was also a pretty vile character. And, and one of his um, predecessors named Antiochus, he sacrificed a pig on the altar of the temple, which threw the Jewish people in, in an uproar. And they ended up rising up and throwing out the Ptolemaic Empire, and they reinstituted the temple worship. And this is called the Maccabean Revolt. And so this is what they celebrate with Hanukkah. And so Hanukkah is that idea of bringing back the light and, and bringing cleansing and temple worship back into place. And then in 60 B.C., um, Caesar conquers the area, and now it's controlled by the Romans. And so as we read this, we have seen a land that has been in such turmoil. There is just chaos. Just imagine if you looked outside and you had like soldiers marching in the street from another empire. How would that feel to you? It would feel oppressive, wouldn't it? It would feel uh, saddening and, and disgusting to know that all of your taxes are going towards paying for these soldiers that you don't want here, uh, building things that you don't really necessarily care about. So they had high taxation. They had a lot of cruelty. Uh, just a lot of things were uncertain. And so it caused all these different factions of groups and belief systems. How many of you have noticed that our society today have a lot of factions, that there's a lot of division and chaos? I mean, in our culture today, I mean, I don't know, you know what groups you want to call out, but there's just certain groups that call out, hey, we got a voice and what we say is right. I don't know if it's Antifa or, or BLM or progressives, Republicans, nationalists, Democrats, whatever you want to call them. We have a lot of people calling for attention and we, we got the truth and we know what we're talking about. And in that time, they had the same thing. They had all these divisions, and so you had within the religious divisions, you had Sadducees and Pharisees. Have you all heard of the Sadducees and the Pharisees? These were people that were, they were greatly nationalistic, and they were all about the law, but then they became so much about their religion that they became corrupt, and so Jesus had to come, and he had to cleanse out the temple on two separate occasions to try to deal with their corruption. They had a whole racket going on. You couldn't even go to church without having to, you know, get shaken down, you know. We, we do offerings, it's a voluntary offering. When they went to church or the temple back then, it was mandatory to pay for certain things. And so Jesus was upset about the corruption that took place at the temple. So you had, you know, these different factions that are saying, no, our way's right. No, our way's right. You had the Herodians, which were pro-Rome. And so you see them operating. And so they love the taxes and they love Rome and all that kind of stuff. So you have a lot of political stuff going on. Zealots. Zealots were the ones who were ready to, to, to take over and stab a Roman with a, with, a, with a knife or something like that. You know, rebellious type of people. Jesus had a zealot as a disciple. Simon the zealot was one of his disciples. So you had all these different groups vying for power and control. It was confusing. It was chaotic. It was dark. It was unknown. And so when he says, in the days of Herod, you're like, oh, yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> the king of Judea, a certain priest. Now we're going to have some good news. A certain priest by the name of Zacharias. Zacharias, his name means the Lord remembers. Isn't that great? God remembers. God remembers his promises. God remembers his word. God remembers. And so this priest by the name of Zacharias of the division of Abijah. Now, uh, just quickly, let me explain this. 
Jacob had 12 sons, right? Became the 12 tribes. One of the tribes was called the tribe of Levi. This was the priestly division. And so when you read in, in Leviticus and Exodus, when they set up the tabernacle and you have all the different priestly duties, the tribe of Levi were the priests carrying out all the priestly duties, the sacrifices and the offerings and all this kind of stuff that you read in the Old Testament. It was their responsibility to carry that out. So Zechariah was from the tribe of Levi carrying out his priestly duties. And in Leviticus, you, you have it like organized, but when King David comes on the scene, David organizes it even more so. And so you read in 1 Chronicles 24, they had 24 divisions of the priests that were Aaron's sons and, and things that they had to do. So here you've got this priest from the division of Abijah. So he's hardcore. He's following the Lord. He's doing what he's supposed to do. His wife was one of the daughters of Aaron too. So she's also a Levite from the tribe of Levi. His wife, his name is Elizabeth, which Elisheva, it means God has an oath. So think about that. What a, pretty, what a beautiful picture that is. God remembers, is married to God has an oath. And God is doing something in both of their lives right now that's going to change history. So you have Zacharias, God remembers, married to Elizabeth. God has an oath. And they were both, y'all help me out, what does it say? They were both what? Righteous. They lived rightly. They did rightly. They believed God. They believed his word. They walked the walk. They talked the talk. They were sold out for the Lord. They walked in all the commandments. Now, how many commandments are there? You know how many commandments there are in, in the Bible? The rabbis taught that there were 613 commandments. That's a lot of commandments, isn't it? So luckily, what God does for us to help us out is he summarizes all 613 to 10. How many of y'all know the 10 commandments? Pretty important, aren't they? How many of you believe we should still follow the Ten Commandments? All right, yeah. No adultery, no stealing, no killing. Pretty good stuff there. So you have all 613 summarized in the Ten. Now, thank you, Jesus. Jesus even summarizes them even more, right? And we've got them hanging on the wall in there. When, when a lawyer said, hey, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He didn't bat an eye. He said what? Love the Lord your God with all of your... That's it. And the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. So he's summarizing all Ten Commandments into two. Command number one, love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul, is the summary of the first four commandments. And then the second one, love your neighbor as yourself, is summarized in the, in the last six. So Jesus summarizes them even more. And it helps us, doesn't it? I love how Jesus does that for us. So these folks, Zechariah and Elizabeth, are faithful, God-fearing, commandment-following people. It also says that they uh, followed the ordinances. What's an ordinance? An ordinance is an act of worship. It's something that God set out for the people to do. Now, in New Testament times, we have two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, which we'll be observing here soon, this month. But in their day, their ordinances had to do with those seven uh, feasts, and all the feasts, by the way, were a foreshadowing of what Jesus was coming to do. For instance, Passover. When they celebrated Passover, which is where we, come, we get the Lord's Supper, they celebrated the fact that they were delivered out of slavery from Egypt. They killed a lamb and they ate the lamb. And the lamb's blood on the doorpost, remember, gave them deliverance. And so that was one of their ordinances was Passover, Feast of Weeks. They had seven of them. So these individuals are faithful, godly, commandment-following, ordinance-following people. They didn't waver. They didn't say one thing and do another. They were faithful. And in our world today, isn't it hard to be faithful? You look around and go, you know what? I don't see anyone else living this way. You know, maybe I should do what culture says. Maybe I should do what feels good. Maybe I should just live how I want to live. And it's easy to feel that way sometimes when you look around and, and there's decay and society just seems to be going crazy. We think, well, why, why does it matter? It matters because God's word is still God's word. And God is still watching. And people are still watching. And so you, hear, you have a godly couple. God sees them, and other people see them too. You ever know a godly family, a godly couple? 
My, my grandparents were kind of like that. I, they just had this aura about them. You know, they had like a big, huge, big Bible out on their, their coffee table. You, ever, you see those big old Bibles with big, I mean, you could like, <laughs> they could be a doorstop. They were so big and heavy. And, and my aunt was the same way. My aunt, uh, Beatrice. And so my grandmother's name was Maxine, and her sister was Beatrice. When we go visit Aunt Beatrice, I mean, she had the big Bible, too, and, and they went to church, and my Aunt Beatrice, she would also cook the Wednesday night meal at church, and we're like, oh, my gosh, you know, she just seemed so godly. And, and so you have these people that you revere and look up to, and this is how Zechariah and Elizabeth were. People watched them and respected them because they lived right. They walked right. And that's so important today because people are watching how we live. And does how we live reflect the great God that we serve? Or are we just living for ourselves? Not Zachariah and Elizabeth. They live for the Lord. So they were faithful. So for point number one, while we are waiting for God to move, while we're waiting on God to answer our prayers, while we're waiting on God to do some things, how do we live? We have to hope in righteous living. We have to live rightly. Do what God has called us to do. We are people of the book. We are people that follow his commandments. We are people that serve Jesus. We are people that gather together. We worship. We serve. We follow. We love the Lord with all our heart, mind, and soul. We love our neighbors, ourselves. We're sharing Jesus. The stuff that's on the hallway, that's what we live as believers, and that's what they lived as well. So we hope with righteous living. Verse 7 this is kind of sad. Now, let me just ask you this. Have you ever had someone put you in a box, just maybe label you in a certain way, go, well, I don't know if you'll amount to anything or not. You know, you, you, you've got this dad, or you've got this relative, or, or you're from that side of the tracks, or, or you, you, you went to that school, or you know, you're in this field, or whatever it may be, people judge you. And, and, and the, their judgment is like off. Have you ever felt that way? Judged, looked down on, misunderstood. You know who you are and you know what God's called you to do, but people call you names. They don't get you. They don't understand. This is what they, they lived with this shadow of shame. And so verse 7 says, it says what? They had no what? Child. Wah, wah. I mean, bad news. That's horrible news. If you lived in that time frame, they believed that, and this is true, that God blessed you with children. And so you, you had the favor and the blessing of God when you have children so you could pass on your you know, money and your wealth and your property through your children. So it was a blessing to have children. But if you didn't have children, something might be wrong with you. You might have sinned in your past life, or you might have done something in, your, in the, your mother's womb. You might have said something, thought something. God's not happy with you. That was the, the mindset. It was a wrong mindset, but that was the mindset. If you didn't have children, you were not fully living God's plan. Something's missing. And uh, that's kind of hard to live that way, isn't it? When you realize, man, is something the matter with me? Or, 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 did I mess up somewhere? Does, does God not look at me as favorably as, as others because he's not answering my prayers? Uh, maybe you, you, you're living out the fact that you've got these dreams and you've got these goals and you've got these hopes, but God's not fulfilling them. And, and, and other people are here, but, but you're back here. And you're like, this is not fair. Does God really love me? Do I have the blessing of God? Do I have the favor of God? Because it seems like, I'm missing out. And so they had this shadow over them of maybe they weren't as godly people as they should be because they didn't have a child. Isn't that sad? People made them feel that way wrongly. They wrongly judged them. So we have to be very careful with our judgments and with things that we say that they don't crush people because we could be wrong. And people were wrong about Elizabeth and Zechariah. They were dead wrong. This is a godly, wonderful couple. And just because they didn't have kids didn't mean that God loved them less or they had less of a blessing. 
They had no child because Elizabeth was barren. Her womb was closed. And we read about other godly women like Sarah and Abraham. She was also barren, and yet God did something amazing through Sarah and Abraham. We read about Hannah in the book of 1 Samuel, also barren, prayed. God gave her a son named Samuel. And so you have this incredible miracle that's taken place here. And so notice, they had no child, and, and, and now it says they're both well advanced in years. Now, what does that mean? They're old, that's right. They're old. And I looked this up in the Greek trying to get a, a time frame on what does it mean to be well advanced in years. And I don't like this definition because I'm getting kind of close to that, to that number. I just had a birthday last week. I turned 53. But to be well advanced in years means that you're 60 years or older. I know that's awful, right? Like that's not fair. But that's what, that's what they said. So now they're, they're, they're barren, and on top of that, you're old. You're not going to have a kid in this state. But isn't that how God works? God loves to get glory for things that you can't take credit for. <laughs> so God's at work in this situation so that it's obvious that it's God that's doing the work and not them. And I'm sure at this point, they'd be like, they just had given up, like, okay. All right, I'm not praying that prayer anymore. That prayer is over with because I'm old. That prayer is over with because I'm done. This body has had it. There's definitely no kids coming. Just imagine the sadness and the sorrow to realize, man, I just am not going to get there. I wonder if they stopped that prayer. So it was. God's fixing to do something great. So it was while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division. We already heard about his division of Bija, so he's doing his priestly duties. And, and, and Luke explains in such detail, according to the custom of the priesthood, you read about this in Leviticus, it, his lot fell to burn incense. Now, in that day, they had about 18,000 Levites in, in, for priestly duty. And so it's kind of like you know, being in the reserve, I guess. You get called up, and it's a once-in-a-lifetime situation, and so they would cast lots because they had too many priests, but once in a lifetime, if, you, if, if, you're, if it fell perfectly, you would get to go to the temple and offer the incense on the altar in the holy place. Now, Zechariah was not a city dude. He was a country bumpkin, and so he comes into town for this special duty. I mean, if you read in Leviticus, he had all this fancy garb on and, you know, it was, he looked incredible. And so he goes in there and he's going to do his priestly duty. He's going to offer the incense on the altar. Now what the incense on the altar, this was a picture. You, you, would, you would put the incense on the altar and it would like smoke. And so the smoke would rise up to the heavens. And it's a picture of our prayers as they go up to God. So he's offering the incense, which is a picture of his prayers going up to God. And I wonder if he thought to himself, my prayers just stay right here. I wonder if he thought, should I even be doing this? Well, we know that he's a righteous man, and we know that he prayed anyway. And so the, the point is we got to keep praying even when it seems like there are prayers are not getting answered. So number two is we hope with waiting and praying. So we're, we're, we're waiting with righteous living. Now we're waiting and we keep praying. Even if it seems our prayers are not being answered, even if it seems like it's been years since we've been praying this, God, we're going to pray anyway. Are you faithful to pray even when it seems like chaos is around us? Right? We have to keep praying for our family. We got to keep praying for our nation. We got to keep praying for revival, right? How many of us are praying for revival? Oh, God, please pour out your spirit. Lord, I pray that our church grows. Lord, I pray that the community is reached. I pray that the world knows the gospel. I just pray that you do something powerful. And so we pray for revival. They were praying for that. They were praying for light in the darkness. They were praying over and over and over for Messiah to come. Oh, Lord, hundreds of years they're praying for the Messiah to come. But guess what? Man, Messiah was coming. And so their faithful prayers, even though it seemed like they were not being heard, God heard their prayers. So he's in the altar, in the holy place, offering the prayers 
And in verse 10, I love this too. It says the multitude of people was praying outside. Isn't that awesome? So it's not just his prayer, but it's the prayers of the people is also powerful. That's why I love coming to church because when we come to church, you can get beat up during the week, but you can come to church and you can find encouragement and find hope and find people that will love on you and hug on you and, and know that we can pray together for things that are burdening us. And so Zechariah's prayers are not his own prayers. They're, they're part of the multitude. So the people are praying for light. The people are praying for God's power. And the people are praying for Messiah. The people are praying together. And notice what it says. Verse 11, whoa, God shows up. What, what happens in verse 11? Then what? An angel. Whew. Man, now sometimes Nikki and I, we scare each other just because we live in close proximity to each other. Like for instance, sometimes I'll walk into the closet and Nikki be like, oh, I wasn't expecting you, you know, or, or vice versa. And so we like get caught off guard. And so this is exactly what <laughs> Zechariah, he's like, oh my gosh, an angel. But when Nikki and I are like, oh, okay, it's, it's just Nikki. Whew. But if you saw an angel, how would you feel? I mean, you might faint, you might fall on the ground, who knows what could happen. And so he is rightfully very fearful, which every single person that sees an angel is very fearful, and the angels often say, fear not, fear not, it's okay. So he's standing on the right side of the incense of altar, and, and there the angel is. Now, verse 19 tells us that this is Gabriel. Gabriel is also mentioned in Daniel two times, and then Gabriel appears to Mary. So angel Gabriel is given the good news. He's a messenger of God, given the good news to Zechariah, and then also Gabriel comes and gives the news to Mary. So this is the angel that is, angel means messenger, the messenger of God. So when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. The angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer is what? heard. I love that. Isn't that great? You've been praying, and I wonder, what was he praying about? Was he praying, oh God, give me a son? Was he still praying that? I don't know. Or was he praying, oh God, send the Messiah. Oh God, bring your light. Oh God, change our, 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 our nation. Change our world. I don't know what his prayer was, but God says that he heard it, and God answered his prayer. Isn't that wonderful? That even though we may be praying, God hears. Even though it may seem like nothing is happening, God is working. And God is working even when we pray and it seems like nothing's happening. So we got to keep living right. We got to keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Your prayer is heard, and your wife, your old wife, <laughs> Elizabeth, will bear you. A son. Wait, come again in my 60s? Yeah, you're going to have a son. And you will call his name, what's his name? John. John. How many of y'all heard of John the Baptist? Have y'all heard of John the Baptist? This is who he's talking about. John the Baptist. The word John means the grace of the Lord. God is graceful. The Lord is graceful. And so you have God remembers, God has an oath, and God is graceful, all rolled up together. The grace of God is coming into the world. It was dark, it was chaotic, it was crazy, but God is stepping into history and he's answering prayer and everything's gonna change. And we have hope in God, we have hope in his plan, we have hope in Christ. John, who's this John? So hope arrives, number three, and it does not disappoint. So we live righteously, that's how we hope. We live and, and, and wait and pray, and then we know the hope is, is coming and it does not disappoint. Verse 14, and you will have joy and gladness. I love that. Because to me, it implies the fact that they had not been having joy and gladness. How many times had they gone to church, or how many times had they gone to temple, or how many times had they lived out their life under a shadow and there wasn't joy, there wasn't gladness, there was depression, there was sorrow, there was wondering, God, are you there? Do you hear me? And now he's saying, you're going to have joy and gladness. And isn't that what kids often bring? I know they can bring sleepless nights and frustration, but how many of you are parents and grandparents and you know that kids also bring joy and 
gladness. And so that's the promise. This son is going to bring joy and gladness. And there it is again. Many will rejoice at his birth. You've been suffering alone, and sometimes when you have other people, you, you have some company. But man, people are going to be rejoicing with you. This is going to be an exciting time. It's going to be amazing. People are going to be giving you high fives. Man, God is great in this awesome. I know you've wanted this kid. Woohoo! So it's a celebration going on among the people of God. Joy, gladness, many rejoicing at his birth. Verse 15, for he will be, what? Great in the sight of the Lord. This is John the Baptist. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 11, he says, among all the people born of women, no one is greater than John. John is an amazing individual. Let's read more about him. It says, He will be great in the eyes of the Lord and shall neither drink wine nor strong drink. Huh? What is that? This may be referring to Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 20, talking about the Nazarite vow. Now, the Nazarite vow is mentioned the fact that you don't eat anything from the, the grapevine, so no raisins and no wine, and then you don't cut your hair either. That's part of what the Nazarite vow is. So who else in the Old Testament was a part of the Nazarite vow? Do y'all remember? Samson. Now, Samson didn't follow the Nazarite vow very well, but, but he, was, he and his family were a part of the Nazarite vow. So you have John the Baptist who is going to not touch any strong drink, so he may have been part of the Nazarite vow. Meaning, if he didn't cut his hair, just imagine how that would look. Huge beard and hair, and he says he wore camel skins and ate locusts and honey. I mean, I'm sure he was kind of a freaky-looking dude, right? <laughs> and as we read about John, we read that he, when, when he, he caused a great revival, and he was out there preaching in the wilderness, and he, and he was preaching, and people were coming to the river and being baptized, and he was preaching and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so he, he had this great preaching ministry, and great numbers of people were coming, being baptized, believing in what John was saying. So he's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord, uh, the, the long hair. Uh, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. Wow. Now, here's how the Holy Spirit works for us as believers today. When we make a decision to follow Jesus Christ in faith, we accept Christ. The Bible says the Holy Spirit comes inside and we're sealed until the day of redemption. We have the Holy Spirit inside. He's our, our guide, our comforter, our teacher. So we have the Holy Spirit upon salvation. John had the Holy Spirit even in, in, in the womb. And so as we look at next couple of weeks when Mary is pregnant with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so Mary and Elizabeth meet. Remember what the baby in Elizabeth's womb did, John? He's like jumping for joy. And so the Holy Spirit's like, hey, hey, there's Jesus. And so he's like worshiping in the womb. It's crazy. But that's what he does. And so from birth, he knew God's plan, God's call. The Holy Spirit was all over him. And so when he was preaching the word, man, people were responding. And it was an incredible time of renewal and revival that was taking place because of John. But it was because of answered prayers. It was because of the movement of God. It was the power of God, the hope of God. It showed up during a dark, chaotic, and crazy Time. Verse 17, he will go before him and the spirit and the power of Elijah. Do you remember what I read to you in Malachi chapter 4? That I will send Elijah and he will turn the hearts. And so it says he's coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Jesus also refers to this in Matthew chapter 11 that John comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. To, why? Why is he coming? To turn the hearts of fathers to the children and, to the, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. That's us, isn't it? And so the, the preaching of the gospel should cause us to turn from our disobedience and turn to the Lord. And so he's turning the hearts of people towards him, the disobedient to just, and to make ready. In John chapter 1, people said, well, are you the Messiah? And John says, no, I'm not the Messiah. 
Well, who are you? He says, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. He's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40. I'm the one, I'm the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. I'm the one that's preparing the way of the Lord. In other words, I'm preaching and I'm preparing that when the Messiah comes, man, your hearts are ready. And that's exactly what John did. And so I want to just leave you with this last question. It says that he will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Are you ready for the Lord? If you were to die and wake up in the presence of God, are you ready for that moment where you'll be before Almighty God? See, Jesus Christ is the one that makes us ready for that because he takes our sins and he washes them all away and we have new life and new purpose. And so we can stand before God and say, well, should I let you into heaven? Well, it's because of Jesus. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is my Savior. I'm ready to meet the Lord, not because of anything I've done, but because of everything that Jesus has done. So are we ready to face him in death? Are you ready if he, we talked about last week, him coming back in the clouds and coming back in glory and power, the second coming of Jesus. Are you ready? If Jesus were to come back, are you ready to meet him? Are you ready to see him? Today's the day that we make sure that that's going to take place. So if you're here today and you've not received Jesus as your Savior, it's just easy by saying, Jesus, come in my life. I receive you. I'm a sinner and you are my hope, right? Jesus is our hope. He's our hope more than than a politician or a political party or an economic boost or any of that kind of stuff. Christ is our hope. He is the one that gets us into heaven. He's the one that changes our lives. And so I hope and pray that your heart is prepared to meet him. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you are our hope, that you provide hope in darkness. You provide hope in in chaotic times. Lord, you are our rock and our stronghold and our fortress. Lord, we hunger and thirst for you. Lord, save us, change us, transform us. Lord, we want to be your people. And we want to live righteously. We want to live holy. We want to be your people and continue to pray for revival, continue to pray for life change. So Lord, just help us to do that. Lord, help us to set our hope fully on you. Thank you so much for the difference you make. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, next week we'll be looking at hope in the impossible. God bless you.